um, and welcome everyone. Um, well, well, to begin with, I think Professor Neil O'Connor is uh, no stranger to the School of Business and uh, Monash University Malaysia overall. Uh, Professor Neil uh, is one of the foremost experts on technology and innovation in manufacturing in China. Um, he has spent 18 years in Hong Kong, where he researched the modernization processes of Chinese firms. And uh, one of his uh, pet project, China 1000 project, is still today the largest ever survey of operational risk issues for foreign buyers and Chinese suppliers. And Neil is also uh, the co-founder of China Sourcing Academy. Uh, he is the author of the China Casebook on Operational Risk, the Management Control of MNC in China. And uh, he has obviously uh, developed corporate business cases for a number of large multinational companies. And um, well, he's been around, definitely. Um, he has previously taught at the Hong Kong Baptist University, City University of Hong Kong, the University of Hong Kong and the National University of Singapore. So we're very, very fortunate to have Neil with us here as the head of the um, Department of Accounting and Finance in the School of Business. Now, Neil is also a very passionate academic and consistently explores innovative methods to improve teaching and learning, which is why he's here today to talk to us about student attention, set you scores and teaching on the knife edge. Metaphorically, the floor is yours, Neil. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you for coming. Teaching on a knife edge, how do you do this? I mentioned a knife edge because a consultant once said that to be a good consultant, you need to push uh, your client to the knife edge to find out what the real underlying issues are. and. Um, when you're a teacher, often the knife edge is, well, do I stay on the safe side so I don't upset the students and get a good set to score? Or, or do I you know, push them a little bit harder, intimidate them in a positive way, uh, but I don't want to do too much, otherwise I'll upset and maybe I'll get some complaints and everything will go south. And so that's how I find the knife edge. And for me, I'm getting old now, um, I feel that's the only way that I can live my life, especially if I want to make an impact for students. Uh, and an impact to me is that they walk out of the class or at the end of the semester with a memorable experience, uh, positive or negative. Uh, there are two things I want to cover today. One is, and as you can see on the uh, left-hand side, there are various aspects of my KFC formula, but on the right hand side is what I'll come back to all of you in this session, and that is talking about how to develop commitment and sharpen your story, but there is a missing element, and that is what we're going to cover uh, later on. But for now, the KFC formula is, uh, the K is the knife edge, which we'll spend most of the time on, but also the F is for the focus and sharing with the students, well, what is your purpose? What is your story? Uh, show students the reason why you are there as a teacher, other than a salaried uh, consultant, you know, you're paid to be there. No, we are more than paid to be in front of the students to impress upon them what you are teaching. And the commitment, well, that's a more of a personal learning aspect where you make commitments to deadlines in the future, like I made a commitment to present today, so now I need to prepare and get ready for it. If I don't make that commitment to the deadline, then my learning doesn't go as fast as what it would go. Some of you can learn without commitments, but I find for most of us, making commitments is very critical for ongoing. Later on, I come back to this large circle, and it's a large circle that allows you to come into the classroom and to take risks and to push students as we've got in the small circle. All right, before we go on to, that's the big picture, but before we do that, I want to show you various tactics and 
give you some examples of what I went through. Now, if this appears to you like a Jerry Brockheimer movie where I'm chopping around, uh, it is. And there's a reason for my approach to this. But for now, there are various tactics I want to take you through and show you examples. And then think, I want you to think, wow, what if you were a student in that class? Would you be intimidated in a positive way, a negative way? Would you complain? Uh, maybe yes, maybe no. By the way, I did get complaints uh, in my class. I'm not saying I'm proud of that, but I managed to manage the complaints. So I'm gonna talk about that as well. So on the first day, we, we set up the assessment, nothing too fancy about that. Uh, what, but what was interesting was I transferred the individual participation and quizzes at 40% into something like this. Uh, every student was given a card and they had to self-report their own uh, meaningful questions, leadership comments, and there was a total. Uh, first of all, the students never seen this before and then they felt a bit put off by that. Some of them were. Okay, if they weren't intimidated by that, then they were definitely intimidated by this. I paid for a RA for, to actually measure the students' participation in every class. And like a lighter diagram, the orange got the highest participation, the yellow got the lowest. And I was able to coordinate that with their self-reporting to make sure that their self-reporting was uh, done. So the students, some of them were intimidated by this, this heat map. And this is something that is practiced in a lot of the top EMBA classes in the world anyway. But I, I thought, oh, I'll try this out because I do this in NUS. It, let's try it here. Well, uh, some students found it a quite uh, intimidating. But anyway, I just want to give you the full picture. All right. Um, if they weren't intimidated by that, they may be intimidated by, well, Monash require 60% of your assessment to be individual. Well, so therefore, 20 marks, uh, 12 and a half of marks, I actually individually assess the group presentation for 12 and a half out of the 20 marks for their presentations. And some students didn't like that, okay? So, all right, so I'm setting up the class very, very well to fail. And let's see uh, what happened on the first day, shall we? So here's our first day. And let me just play this. I'm gonna turn my microphone off. We don't get any extra feedback. This is so you can see, okay, what is the class I'm in? Obviously, this is MB, this is an MIB, Master of International Business, and we have 40, 40 welcome, students. Welcome all. My name is Neil O'Connor. How many of you have seen me before? <coughs> Couple of you. Great, okay. They have, uh, somehow I am teaching global supply chain management. It is by design because about 10 years ago, I decided that I wanted to stay practical. What you're going to get in the next 12 weeks is you're just going to get authentic me, okay? I'm not making up anything. I'm, I'm going to teach you stuff that I have witnessed and experienced, not what I've read. Don't you come from hover, hoover, hoverboards? Yes, we all love them. The US government banned them in 2016. Why did they ban the hoverboards? How, how do little factories survive? Part of this course, we're jumping ahead here, part of this course is to make you much more sensitive and maybe empathetic, but being empathetic makes you a much better negotiator of suppliers. Just a point there. Notice how I'm jumping ahead, right? I'm given uh, some entertainment. I'm challenging them a little bit 
but also I'm jumping ahead and saying, well, I'm not reading out what the course objectives are. I'm telling them in my own words, in my own experience, this is what the course is doing for you. Okay, so, you know, maybe I can do that because of my experience, blah, blah, blah. Uh, we're going to get back to that. How do you get into that position where you can do that? But I just want to see, I want to show you how I was intimidated. Uh, the challenges in 2018. How many of these challenges are today? Globalization, is that a challenge? So, for um, 60 seconds in your group, I want you, out of that list, pick out the top three that you think is relevant. The challenges in 2019. Go, it's 55, 54. 10 seconds, five, four. Okay, you want three from every table. Okay, top three. Don't overthink this, all right? Don't overthink. Supply chain management is very, very operational. Okay, one more student comes in. You need another chair to information. And that's why it's very important. Part of this course is that I introduce to you some frameworks. Why do we have a framework? All right, why do we have frameworks? Why, why do we have a framework like this? What does this framework help you do? Okay, notice. Okay, notice, no, that's the end of that video, but notice I introduced a framework. Now we all need that framework, I've required all my staff to make a framework for their course, like a picture. We have a framework according to WACSB guidelines and close and loop and you know the assessment, the rubric that Monash require, we understand that. But put it in the visual terms, so rather than, did you notice that rather than, our oh, students, here's the framework, now Number one, this is what we're going to do, then week two, then week three, then week four. The first thing I said to the students, oh, why do we have this framework? So I'm asking why questions immediately. I'm trying to get the students to question what I'm doing rather than to just assume that what I'm doing is good for them. I'm actually asked, I'm trying to get them the question of why immediately from the first class. Okay, and then, you know, I will not uh, just get somebody to do it. What do you think about this course? It's, it's okay. a hard process, but if you want to know what your brand is, this is the way to go. And with knowing your brand, then what you okay. can do is you can- so Next, it. we have, um, there's a recap. There's a ways of recapping. I've got some fallback. Uh, we, remember, in week one, we talked about time, remember? Remember VF Corp? What is the cost of time? Then last week, Again, time has come up again in why companies are collaborating. You see, it's a theme that's coming through. You with me? So these are not 12 independent weeks as we go around that clock. Ah, okay. Notice that, I just told, remind the students, the theme, I reminded them, these are not 12 independent weeks as we go around the framework. So I'm constantly reminding the students every week, this is a theme we're going through and to really take, these are building blocks that each of the weeks are building on. Okay, so let's move on. Uh, there was uh, some people went into the wrong groups and then I challenged them, stop wasting time, just um, move around, change groups, whatever. Okay. Someone submitted a project. Okay, uh, challenge participation. So I was in for about the fourth week. Okay, just a reminder on the participation, I have got all your cards here and I've now stapled them to groups. So you're in a group, you're in, your card will be seen by your group. Yes, you can voluntarily put down what, so what am I doing now? Okay, just a reminder of what I'm doing now is starting to remind the students that they're formalizing. This is week four now and I'm reminding them that well, hang on, you know, there is an assessment procedure we're going through. We are recording your activity and week four, rather we didn't set it in week one and then forget it for the rest of the semester. Okay, use props is very important. I can do that, why? Because I've- How does Cherry QQ do it? All right, I'm going to ask for participation. Yes. Um, by using like cheaper materials, for example, like wood is uh, 
Cheaper materials. Like wood as opposed to steel. Wood instead of steel. In a car. In a car. <laughs> oh, that's very, that's very, I understand, like, like, I got this given to me the other day and it's just, it's rubbish. It doesn't work. I charge it up and it stops working. It's probably got sand in it. Don't worry, they put sand in these to keep the weight up because they don't want to put so much battery in. Okay, props are very good and throw things around. How does Cherry destroy things? I do that. Uh, during the semester as with the students. But there are many different ways of thinking about how to constantly engage the students. And this is what I did during the semester. And many props to participation. Uh, and then even using video that I've got from visiting. What is this? <laughs> All right, so, you know, remember, you know about this, right? You know, you right? Right, don't worry about that. And what okay. I just did then is I just hammered an iPhone. I just put an iPhone on the desk and I just I just hammered it and just threw it off the side. Just as, it was a copy. They didn't know that. But sometimes those were some of the things that I was doing from what I had. Okay, so just talking, getting back to the uh, working with the students, but actually getting back to. Um, you know, just done a bit of my Jerry Brockheimer, you know, presentations with the videos. So you saw how uh, some of the things that I did during the semester and in some ways quite intimidating. And I, I think in week five, no, week five, there was a complaint that went through to Ravi and he was a director of the MIB program. And he came and said, oh, student complaints about something. And I didn't fully understand. And I think two weeks later, then it went to the head of school and then the head of school explained to me what the situation was. And what it really was is I forgot to put up, uh, they were a bit intimidated by the participation and having to participate and be scored every week in, week out, uh, and have someone in there watching and participate. But also at the same time, they, felt that, oh, the unit guide wasn't properly put up onto Moodle. And so that was a, you know, a mistake that I made. And, but at the time that the complaints came through, I felt very, wow. I thought, man, what am I going to do? It was a very sad weekend when I heard there was a complaint. I thought everything was going well, but I, I wore that. And so what I had to do was to go back and then think about, well, I need to address this head on and actually go into, into, let me just uh, go forward. Uh, how to scroll? Well, I just want to go forward. Pit stop. Time's up on going through all these. Oh. Must have, okay. Uh, have energy. Yeah, there's lots of Passage, mate. Okay. Okay. Ah, here we are, student complaints. So then I had to address the complaints head on. And so then I read out some of the complaints. At the feedback, some board. feedback received, uh, which is all always welcome. So I'm happy to have any feedback. And So first of all, I said, I welcome your feedback. It's very, very important. I actually didn't say it was a complaint. I said, I received some feedback and I welcome the feedback. And I actually typed it out on the PowerPoint slide so without any names or anything like that, and then made it very, very clear for the students what they um, are giving feedback about. And then I proceeded to talk about, well, these are the things that I am going to do from now on. And then I made it clear. And so in the end, we got through to the end of the semester and just uh, ring fencing what I was just um, you know, going through the intimidation phases, getting the complaints and then dealing with the complaints. Then we got through to the end. Um, in the end, you know, uh, the SETU scores figured themselves out. And part of the reason why was because of a, I, in the end, um, and it's a big theme I'm going to come to in a minute, is you need to have authority or you need to feel that the students see you as an authority in what you are teaching rather than as a, a hired consultant or just a salaried person, all right? Are you an authority or not? When you're authority, then it's much easier to be on the knife edge. There's plenty more videos that we can look at, but 
uh, in the ideas of time and also looking for questions that you may have as we're coming. At the... I just want to show you one, another tactic that I used. That is, uh, if students don't get it, repeat your lecture again in three minutes. And exactly what I do here. So I'm looking at the students. We're going to come back to this. I want to show you one diagram that summarizes a lot of what I talked about. Okay, here it is here. All right, so now I've already had this on the PowerPoint. I've gone through things and I'm thinking they're not getting it. Okay, then I'll do it again. I'll get the whiteboard out and then let's just do this. Let's just do this. There it is. Can you all see that? Can you all see that? Come around if you can't see it. This is big. This is big. This is. I want you to think about this. And this is, this, is, this is basically it in a nutshell about control. It's all about having total control. You, you multi-source, why? Because it enables you to create market forces. Why? One could supply competing against another supply. But also it enables you to deal Neil, you're muted. You have to unmute yourself. Neil? Prof, we can't hear you. Neil? Oh, sorry. Got it. All right. Yeah. Got you. Thank you. So what I do here is, you know, I realized that students were switching off with the PowerPoint. So I thought, okay, I'll get the whiteboard out and then let's do this again and create it right in front of them. Uh, the drawing here wasn't even on the whiteboard and I just drew it in front of them and just explained it right again. And so there are different ways that you can double up or triple up on the story you're trying to get across to students. Uh, just because you're authority doesn't mean you have to do it in the most fancy way. You can go back to basic whiteboard or chalkboard as I've done here. And as you can see on the PowerPoint uh, at the back here, I'm not gonna play the video, you can see on the whiteboard, there's the picture there, exactly the same picture, but it's drawn up in a nice fancy PowerPoint. Sometimes students see it when you actually draw it out in front of them on the whiteboard. Okay, so um, how do you reach the students? Just getting back to the main theme of what I wanted to show you, because often, as you can see, you know, there's video evidence there that I did um, go on the knife edge in terms of challenging the students with their assessment. Um, I had props, I damaged things, I threw things around, uh, I challenged them. And one thing you also noted that I used the microphone for most of the time. I didn't need to use the microphone. I think one of the complaints was that I talked too loud. And, um, uh, but I thought, and in a response to that, you know, I just turned the microphone down a little bit, but I didn't stop using the microphone. And, you know, these are all in-class tactics that I use during the semester. So what is it that you don't see? You know, you know, you see that in the classroom, but what you don't see is this greater wheel, and that is the outer game. And some, this is something that I'd like to just emphasize for a lot of ECRs, early career researchers, and that is working on your promise to others. Because often you, we go into the classroom and we're just thinking of the inner game, our promise to ourselves. Well, my promise to myself is that I'll be a good teacher for the students. My promise to myself is I'll be clear in what I'm teaching. My promise to myself is that the students will understand what I'm talking about. Well, that in some ways is a little empty if you don't work on the outer game and that is your promise to others. And if I look at the green area, I would ask ECRs or early career researchers, you know, what do you want to be a thought leader in? And then you've got that, sorry, that's the orange area, the green area, how to become a thought leader. In some ways for me, it was taking massive action. As I said in 2010, I started doing this, um, the thousand interviews. And then you get to command authority through interactions with industry. Like I've given 120 presentations to industry in the last 10 years uh, and professional associations in addition to academia, but more than half of them have been to industry. 
and that forces you to really be up to date with what you are teaching. And so when you're able to get that promise to others done with basically your promise to others is your promise to industry as a thought leader. If you can deal with that, it's so much easier to go into the classroom and number one, tell stories or tell your big story and then go on to that knife edge where you can take risk because students see you as an authority. A challenge that I find with a lot of teachers or students, a challenge I've had in the past is that if students don't see you as an authority, uh, saying to them, oh, this, what I'm telling you, you need to know in order to get a job. Oh, what I'm telling you, oh, this is good for you because this is the standards that you need to have if you want to be an accountant. Uh, that's not your authority. You're just relaying what students may want to know one day in a particular career. Uh, what I'm saying is that in order to transform or transcend into an authority figure, you need to work on this outer promise to others. And then you can go into the classroom and tell your story. And my big story for students, right in the first session and what I just said to them, I said, you know, the big picture here is that I'm gonna teach you how to talk with suppliers. But more than that, how you can empathize with suppliers. And well, more than that, if you can talk with them, if you can empathize with them, then you can be a better negotiator. That, and that was my big story for the students. Um, did I read that in a textbook? No, I made it up through my hundreds of iterations with working with suppliers and talking to business. In some ways, my, some of my approach is atheoretical, but I'm just, what I want you to take away today is to think about well, how do you get to te teach on the knife edge? I'm not asking any teacher to go into the classroom and start taking risk without thinking about uh, their own story and without thinking about whether they've made commitments to uh, develop their learning. And that means commitments to their outer gain, commitments to doing industry presentations, commitments to running workshops for associations, which, you know, this takes a little bit of, away from research, but, you know, if this is what needs to be done, in my view, to get prepared so you can each teach on a knife edge, you can intimidate the students in a positive way, you can get complaints, and you can recover. And in the end, they all gave me a high set to score. It was, in the top 10%, so very appreciative of that. But I just want to show you the background behind what I have done, and I'm happy to um, leave the floor open for questions so we can talk more and have a bit more of a, a uh, discussion session, okay? Okay, thank you, Neil. Um, certainly was a very, very interesting um, um, sharing about your teaching method in your class. Um, you definitely took a lot of risk. I don't think um, any of us had ever hammered anything in class, a reel or a copy. Um, and um, certainly, I mean, I personally would have to uh, rethink about what are my commitments as an educator and how am I gonna go about teaching at the knife edge. Um, now I would uh, open it to the floor. Does anybody have any questions uh, to, uh, for Neil? Um, I do <laughs> have a question, but firstly, a comment. Thank you very much, Neil. Um, I really enjoyed that, and you certainly kept me um, not just entertained, but um, kept me engaged for, for the whole of that session, and, and it's clear why. I mean, students certainly do appreciate uh, uh, things that are a little bit different in the class. We hear too often that students are bored. Um, but I, I have a question about a couple of your, um, I, I think you called them tactics. And one is in relation to your seat map. I really liked that. Unfortunately, not all of our teachers can have a research assistant sit in their class and help them. Um, but when you get to professorial level, maybe you can. But I really liked that. But what I did notice was that the hotspots, 
seem to be clustered in the same tables. So do you think there's um, a propensity for students who are like-minded to maybe sit together on their tables? And so that's why we observed that a lot of the hotspots were clustered together and there were a couple of tables where there seemed to be little or no interaction. And if that's the case, what would your recommendation be to sort of spread, I guess, the, the interactive love around? Yeah, that's a good question. I think when I do it next time, I need to be a little bit more mindful of how we are encouraging participation from those tables where the hotspots were not uh, happening. And uh, during that session, okay, when it did occur, I left it as it went and I just reached out to different tables individually rather than from the class. Uh, but you're right, there was a definite difference and there were group things happening in some tables that were much more, uh, what do we call it, audible than in other classes. And I would say that part of it was a culture difference. Uh, doing it differently maybe would be to mix the classroom tables up and... I would not, doing this again, I would not have the individual cards for the students. I think that went too far. But having someone to record their uh, participation, I found it was so much easier to focus on your own material. So I think mix, and then, okay, so that, that was the dilemma you're in, right? Because in order to have the hotspots, Ideally, you want the students to sit in the same place every week. And, but maybe you start to do that after the second or third week when in the first two or three weeks, you, you mix it up so the students get to work and to openly participate uh, with different other students. And so by the time they go into their own set by the fourth or fifth week, where you maybe do a more formalised approach to gauging their participation, then it is already mixed up and less likely you get that hotspot. Thank you. A very good question, yes. Any other questions? Um, I don't have another question, but um, in terms of the participation cards, I actually really liked that. I found it what it might serve is for students to actually be confronted by how much they are or they are not participating um, in, in a, a very practical way um, that's written down, that's right there. Um, so I found that that could have some really good uses in um, highlighting to students that whilst you might think you're participating, actually you're not. So I'm interested to hear what other people who are here with us this afternoon thought about the participation card. If anyone's got a view? Well, I think having participation card is definitely very intimidating. Um, culturally, I think that Asian students um, tend to be a little bit more reserved and um, they would certainly be intimidated by the participation card. Mm. Um, so Neil, how do you deal with this problem, knowing that some of the students uh, were definitely uncomfortable in your class and yet you have to try to engage them? Yes, I found that they were uncomfortable by the time we got into week four and it was kind of a bit too late to say, well, we're not going to do it. Um, okay. Okay, participation card works if it's used in other classes across the board in, say, the Master of International Business. So then the students don't see this as, hey, this professor is different from all the others. And for me, that difference is in a very negative way, okay? So <laughs> from the student's perspective. Uh, so doing it again, I would back off. I think I had, if, if we bring up the card again, I've, let me just uh, go it in. 
I would back off how much score was associated with their own uh, personal assessment. So then it's, uh, okay, there we go. What did we have? We had three, five, and two. In the end, originally, yeah, what I did was, okay, I took over the leadership comments. I said to students, okay, you've been intimidated by doing the whole 10 marks. Okay, you do the, the three and the five, and I'm going to do the last, the last two. If I did this again and did use the card, I would probably say three, three and four. And then I will mark the four leadership comments and maybe they just have out of three for their own participation. Of course, the 15 minutes on time, that's, uh, that's quite black or white, black and white. So then that's three out of 10 for their own, it's not as intimidating. And then I can, I'm free to put four out of 10. So uh, if I were to use it again, I would change the weighting that way. Adnan, what do you think? Is Adnan there? Or Mazit? Mazit, are you in the... Got I mean, yeah, I'm, I mean, I mean... Mazit, what do you... Have you I've seen this before? I'm ne yeah, I've never really used it myself, um, but I do agree with uh, Joey that it might be a little bit intimidating given the uh, nature of the, our students and, and the culture in general. So... Yeah. I, I don't know. I, I haven't really considered it myself yet. Sorry, I didn't realise that this was actually worth 20% of a student's grade. So whilst I like the, the, the notion of students having to reflect on their own participation and being confronted by you are or you aren't, but yes. um, actually grading participation towards a final assessment is... It's, it's a bit questionable these days, I think. Yes. And in fact, our regulator texts are um, right. kind of frowns upon us yeah. awarding grades towards a final mark for participation. Right. Yeah, yeah. But, but I still do like the notion of actually getting students to reflect on their own participation and being mm. confronted by it and actually being to question, am I making a contribution, am I not? Yes, yeah. Okay. Uh, no. Neil. <clears throat> I can come back, uh, Neil, you asked me earlier on a question on, um, I haven't used this as well before, so I can't uh, comment on the participation card per se, but, uh, but generally when it comes to participation, um, I have a mixed feelings about it. I mean, whether it should be graded or not. So uh, as a teacher, you know, when we had participation marks, uh, especially in large units, when you had 300, 400 students, and particularly in tutorials, uh, that, that's where you can sort of really have, have them engaged. Um, I noticed that participation marks are good incentive. I mean, the students certainly, they are more active knowing that they will get some marks for it. But then again, the problem comes with uh, marking, you know, it's very subjective. It's very hard to come up with something, even if you have your own marking rubric, you know, if you try to make it sort of rationalize it, make it objective, still the students wouldn't view it as such. And I always had almost every time I had questions and some sort of issues with uh, uh, with, with, with sizable number of you know students uh, mm. uh, who actually uh, have problems you know they question the, the the participation marks or the way that they have been awarded you know so I don't really know you know um, uh, well some some of the colleagues have now they have, they have started sort of quizzes you know and so as soon as you attempted something you have got some marks but. Uh, yeah. But then how do you gauge the quality of participation, you know, and uh, yeah, yeah. Adnan, I think you're very um, generous to students saying that participation marks encourage them to engage. <laughs> I think what it encourages them to do more is to attend. <laughs> yeah. And, and of course, when, <laughs> when we have large numbers of students <laughs> in our classes or our, you know, tutorials or our workshops, um, unfortunately, we revert to participation equaling attendance. Mm. But then, you know, we know that if there are good things happening in class and we want students to attend, then they need to be there to, um, you know, get the benefits of that. And I think this is why uh, the regulator texts are 
sort of moved away from that because they realised that it, it's really about attendance at the end of the day. And um, unless we have attendance as a learning outcome, then we don't really have much alignment between learning outcomes and assessment mm. by marking attendance. Yeah. Well, Beverly, Monash, uh, well, we, we can't give marks for the attendance and we shouldn't. No. I don't think, no. you know, we should be giving marks for the attendance. But uh, in Monash, participation marks are still there in the, in the policy. I mean, one, it's, it's a recognised uh, uh, yes. mode of assessment, right? Yes. Yeah. And it, it makes sense in, in a lot of units. In some units, it doesn't necessarily make sense to participate yeah. because it still has to be aligned to a learning outcome. Even if right. it's in the policy that you can award grades to participation, then, you know, if it's a, a, a sort of an MBA unit that has um, leadership and negotiating and working in groups as a learning outcome, then students need to be able to demonstrate they can participate to, for you to justify awarding those grades. But in a lot of units, it makes no sense because participation is not a learning outcome. It's just really a product of their learning process. So we do have to be a little bit careful. And unfortunately, you know, a lot of staff are not necessarily well developed in what does, how do we actually measure participation? What activities can we realistically set up whereby we can observe and measure participation without mm -hmm. it defaulting back to attendance. So right. it's, um, it's not a one size fits all. And I'd be very concerned if I started to see participation in, in random units all over the place. Right. Just uh, moving that to the other challenge I had, and I mentioned it before, I'll just mention it again when we talk about this, is you know grading the presentations and I think uh, when I teach this again, I'm going to ask the students, uh, don't present in class, or you present in class, but I'm not going to grade your presentation in class. I'm going to ask you to make a presentation video. And then it's easier for me to grade individual participation in the video, in the group. It's much harder real time to do it when you're in the class. Uh, when the students are expecting you to give a feedback immediately um, and especially in the culture that we're in. And so that's something that I'm going to change. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's, yeah. A, that's a really, really excellent idea um, for all of the reasons you've said. And also, um, yes, when you're watching something in real time and you're, you're grading it, then you're, you might be fairly confident that you've graded um, fairly and equitably and all of that. Mm. But then if we think about the student experience, they want to ask a lot of questions. Why did I get this? Why didn't I get that? Whereas mm. if they can watch the video and look at your grading rubric and how you graded them, then they can actually see. Yeah. And it makes it's actually a very powerful learning tool as well having some grades against a rubric that relate to a presentation. It's really the, one of the best ways that students can improve. Yes. It's an awesome idea. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Mazut, any comments? I think great presentation, Prof. Um, I'm not at that level yet to challenge my students in that way, but I hope to get there one day. Can you... Ms. It, maybe you can share because we're, we're teaching together on the FinTech course and getting their participation through Zoom is a challenge in itself as well. It is a challenge, but I kind of feel that um, we, we've succeeded at least to some extent, uh, given all the circumstances. Um, to me, yeah, of course, to, to, to any teacher, I think participation is crucial. It makes it more interesting and lively. But... I think what's, in, at least how I feel from my experience, to, to make them participate, I think the, to me, the single most important thing is to make them comfortable, mm. um, you know, with, with ourselves and uh, not, 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 not make them feel that we want to intimidate them intentionally, but just make them feel comfortable, make them feel that we're there as you know, friends and colleagues as mm. instructors. And I, I don't know, I've, this is my first semester at Monash, but I kind of feel that uh, we've been quite successful in that in that in, in that unit. 
uh, the participation has been quite okay. Not all of them were uh, actively participating, but I, I would say that at least 50% of the students, you know, were actively participating throughout the semester. And towards the end of uh, uh, this semester, we have students who are also comfortable turning their videos on and communicating. That wasn't the case in the beginning, but I guess that that's normal. We gave them some time to get used to us, uh, to become comfortable, and now it seems to be okay. Right, okay, that's good. Sharon, any comments? Um, yeah, sorry I was uh, late, Neil, because I had another meeting. No, never, never too late. Yeah, very you interesting got, sharing. You got, you got your three marks for being 15 minutes on time. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Neil, <laughs> for your consideration. <laughs> Uh, but I think uh, this is a very special semester, especially as we are taking teaching online. And um, I concur with uh, Muzat about making students comfortable, especially uh, with the way things are going. And I also agree with uh, Joey that uh, a lot of our Asian students, they, they, they feel intimidated about these uh, participation uh, marks and mm. getting share uh, in front or even to share their thoughts but I think uh, this is something a lot of us can consider moving forward um, how to actually engage them in uh, different ways yes yes and and we got a multicultural group of students too yes uh, yes um, yes the essence of taking risk is that sometimes we don't know whether something is going to work um, and um, but you know if, if we don't try it out then uh, we would not really improve and obviously Neil you experiment quite a lot with your pedagogical methods and um, we've seen that you know you did receive complaints and so on now there's there are only 12 weeks in a semester and uh, often whenever you try new innovations in your cohort, when you face problems, how fast do you turn around and address those problems? Yes. Yes, I had a bad weekend when I found out about the first complaint. And I, I, I address it in the next class. Just, but oh, the reason why the, the, the complaint wasn't solved because I... I didn't know the full, the exact detail of the complaint. And it wasn't, the actual writing on the letter wasn't passed to me. But the second time around, I, I, I said, look, can I have a look at the actual wording of the complaint? I don't care who it's from. I just want to know exactly what they are mentioning. And once I realised, oh, I can fix that. So I, I should have uh, sought out the exact detail of the complaint, the uh, first time around so um, yeah it's but yeah it's a bit off-putting when you get that but I think what you're highlighting here Neil is that um, currently our systems our student feedback systems don't allow us to be responsive and reflective quick enough Mm. So we rely on students um, making a complaint that's completely outside of the box. So mm. our, our set to arrangement of collecting feedback is at the end of the study period. We don't get to respond. So mm. we really need to look at, we've needed to do this for a long time, all institutions, more real-time opportunities for feedback. We don't want to wait until a student feels they've had such a bad experience that they have to put a complaint through mm. the official complaint channel. We yeah. want to empower students to give, you know, as regular feedback as we deem is appropriate in a unit of study so that we then can, so, you know, maybe at the end of week two, we, we have a, a quick five question thing and then the next lesson or even virtually, we, we respond to that feedback. Um, and I think when we start doing that, then one, we can respond in a much more timely manner and, and students will feel more empowered. And, you know, sometimes the student feedback is, is out of whack and it's not something that actually we need to knee jerk react to, but we can comment on it and we can explain why we're doing something in a particular way 
or why we're expecting students to do something that they may feel uncomfortable with. Mm -hmm. So this, this is really about us as an institution having better mechanisms for more real-time feedback yeah. for our students so that we can respond more timely. Uh, I get in part, it, part of it's cultural, like they will use the Monash system when they know black and white, oh, there's a specific thing that the professor has done wrong. So for example, I think they triggered the Monash system when I failed to put up the unit guide into Moodle in the proper format. And so it's black and white, but ultimately their feeling of being uh, intimidated was there too, but that's something they couldn't be, com they couldn't complain about, but it was this not me, me failing to put the correct form up into Moodle that triggered the formal system that Monash had. And so in some ways that's part of the culture that they're not going to use that formal system if there's, if it's a gray area, it's very hard for them to uh, substantiate, you know, the problems that they're having. Um, we encourage the, our staff in our department to use a magic form, which I did during the semester. Uh, but then, and I said, look, you don't have to, I tell the students, look, you don't have to put your name on it, but, you know, uh, feedback on the form. And often, even then, they're reluctant to put in any negative feedback. Um, it's part and parcel the cultural situation. So it's, I guess, um, me being intimidating, it's hard for that, me to encourage uh, negative feedback. <laughs> Maybe I come in worse than the following week. So, yeah, these are things that I've been reflecting on in how you um, elicit in a very comfortable way uh, feedback that you can do things better. Yeah. yeah, I do agree with you, Neil. Um, to a certain extent, uh, the cultural context does play a very important role um, because personally I know that students um, are often reluctant to actually give their chief examiners or their tutors direct feedback but rather mm -hmm. they will tell the representative for the particular major uh, or the particular year and I'm referring yes. to the Monash University Student Association representative yes. and then they let the representative bring it up with the chief examiner yeah. and they would rather stay anonymous that way. Yes. So we have had um, situations whereby uh, complaints or feedback, uh, negative ones, get channeled to us through that method. And obviously yeah. it wastes a lot of time. Whereas if students uh, would have been more proactive and um, uh, in, in, uh, or, or, or rather if, if, if there's a, if, if they're less, um, intimidated and that they could have just uh, brought that uh, feedback directly to the uh, chief examiner and that would have saved a lot of time. Yes, yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you, Joey, thank you. Any other comments, people? Um, just that I have to leave. Thank you, Neil. Um, thank you, Beverly. For the, for the presentation, the discussion, and thank you, everyone. I look forward Wonderful. to meeting you all in person when Beautiful. travel is permitted. Thank you, Beverly. Thank you, Beverly. That's very good. So, um, well, Joey, we're we've got up another on minute. The um, does Pardon? anybody have any question for Neil? A burning last question. How do you, how, how do you okay. Neil? How, how do you remain so energized, Neil? Um, how do I remain so energized? <laughs> I don't know. I ask myself at the start of each day, what, what am I doing here on this planet? And I try and listen for the first 20 minutes to some motivational talk. And I do not look at my smartphone. Uh, first 20 minutes every day. I tell, I'm telling the students this also. Don't look at your WhatsApp, smartphone, social media, um, meditate, read a good book, um, focus on strategy for the first 20 minutes when you get up. Right, right. 
um, and then always find some time to do exercise every day. Right. Yeah. Sorry. Thanks, Neil. Okay, hey, um, ladies and gentlemen, it is now four o'clock and uh, the session has come to an end. Um, I would like to thank Professor Neil O'Connor for a very stimulating talk. Um, and uh, yeah, and you have certainly given us a lot of uh, food for thought and, uh, you know, with uh, your advice in uh, taking uh, risk uh, in our teaching and also uh, looking back into what are our commitments as educators, what we promise ourselves and what we promise our students. Mm -hmm. I think that's quite a lot of takeaway for us. Yes. And thank you, Neil, so much. And thank, thank you, you everyone for logging in. And I will hand back the session to uh, our Zoom host, uh, Claudine. Claudine, thank you. Thank you, Joey. Right. Thank you, Prof. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Gandhi. So, um, before we end the session, uh, Dr. Sharon, do you have anything else to add on? Uh, nothing on my end. Thank you. Okay. Anybody Hello. else has anything Hello. else to, call, to say? Okay. Then uh, we will end the session here. Um, I will stop the recording and we will have this recording shared with our colleagues that uh, were not able to join us today. Right? Thank you, Claudine. Okay, thank you so much, Prof. Thanks, everybody. Welcome. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, have a good. Enjoy. Have a good evening, Thanks, everyone. Bye bye. Bye. bye.